Hi everyone, and welcome to the fifth week of Migration Contemporary Debates. Um, we've shared a lot of experiences these past five weeks. We've heard from some absolutely amazing speakers. Um, we've seen um, perhaps an overrepresentation of, of some of the academic standpoints on some of the contem contemporary debates going on in, in Europe. And then unfortunately, our um, session uh, last week, uh, our speaker had some technical problems, but we're rescheduling that in the following week, where we would have taken the perspective outside of Europe, um, looking at the exploitation of um, labor migrants in Qatar, um, taking a critical view of the World Cup, um, but you will have that um, next week instead. And uh, this week, we're doing um, something I'm personally very excited about. We're taking a closer look at how civil society um, can actively uh, both influence uh, politics, but especially also um, take a stand when they disagree with the political views uh, and political decisions made by a government. And um, we're very lucky to have Inge Tranda with us today. And she is from the organization Vindli Borne, um, that we have shared some materials and a video about that I know all of you have prepared before the lecture today. Before I hand over um, the, um, the live stream to you, Inge, I, um, I want to remind everyone that we have the Q&A feature where you can introduce yourself and let us know that you're watching. And you can send any messages for Inge, but especially we're very excited about any questions that you may have. Inge, thank you so much for coming. Um, perhaps you could start by introducing yourself a little bit further. Sure. Uh, my name is Inge Tranter, um, and I live in Denmark, in the north of Denmark. Um, I work as an artist and a teacher. Um, I'm originally born in South Africa um, and have moved around a lot. And uh, I'm part of the Venibor movement in Denmark, which is a grassroots uh, movement um, helping well, being friendly to people, basically, and um, helping refugees as a sort of sideline. <laughs> but generally, just being friendly towards people. Great, Inge. Thank you so much. And I understand you've prepared a little something um, about Wendy Buona for us today. Uh, well, yes, I have some text uh, here that I can read from our website. Um, the idea for Wendy Buona originated in connection with the health project in Yering municipality. Um, a lady called Mavete Bona Pilgo was employed from 2010 to 2014 to promote health in a particular area of Yang. Health checks on the residents in the area showed that diet, smoking, alcohol and exercise factors were a challenge, but mental health was also a challenge. Uh, many people felt very sad and lonely, and there were not a lot of social activities that people wanted to participate in. Staff at the health centre in Yering went to work systematically organising courses in stopping smoking, weight loss and walking. And on one of the tours, Marita Bilgord realised that the residents were more interested in conflicts uh, with each other than they were in the discussions mm -hmm. about the impact of the physical activity on their health. So they also, they also weren't terribly kind about when they talked about one another. Uh, so they needed to improve their manners. Um, but, you know, no one was really greeting each other, so who was going to start, um, start this movement? So Marietta decided that the walking team would be the group spearheading the campaign uh, for greater friendliness and kindness. And the walking team agreed. Um, so they attended a lecture on the impact of friendliness and were given weekly tasks in training on how to be friendly by saying good morning, opening the door, you know, these basics mm -hmm. that people can forget in situations like that. Uh, and this, um, the good atmosphere kind of spread gradually and people started to become quite competitive at being polite and friendly towards one another. Um, so, and the general health in the area was also given a boost. Uh, people reported feeling happier and less lonely and started to participate in social events. And they also had enough energy to start making other lifestyle choices like uh, stopping smoking, losing weight and exercising. Um, and Marita, when she'd stopped the project, wanted to continue working with uh, friendliness and her leisure time. So she asked uh, four women in her group of friends whether they wanted to make Euring municipality a friendlier place to live in. Uh, and this was the group who in invented Venliborne. And the original Facebook group was just called Venliborne. Um, 
and this was established in June 2013 uh, and was just intended as a local group for Yang. But um, then at some point, I'm just trying to think the date which I have here, uh, 2014, in the autumn of 2014, uh, 500 um, refugees uh, arrived in Yang and uh, Mareta decided to post on the Facebook group for volunteers to receive them. And 13 people volunteered and they established the venue born of Flukning Yilp, uh, which is a venue born refugee help Facebook group. Um, so since then, uh, the initiative has grown explosively. Um, there are over 90 cities in Denmark with a total of 150,000 venue born. Um, and it's kind of spread to other countries as well. So there are groups in Norway, Sweden, Germany, France, Italy, Hungary, United Kingdom and Holland. Um, many of the sub works, subgroups only work with refugees, but the basic values are the same. Um, so the three key sentences that we uh, focused on are one, be friendly in your account, encounter with others. Two, be curious when you meet people who are different to you. And three, meet difference with respect. Um, so those are the, basically the key uh, aspects to being a venibor. Um, and the purpose in relation to the refugees is that the refugees should feel welcome um, and that they are greeted with friendliness uh, because that's actually quite a big issue for people when they come to a place like Yoeng, which is kind of not terribly diverse actually. Um, and this big group of people kind of moved in. It was quite noticeable that they moved into the town. Um, and, you know, we're not work, working, so we're kind of uh, milling about in the shopping centers and so on. They were very noticeable. And for them, it's been, it's been quite a, a big thing to actually just be um, treated with respect and with uh, friendliness. Um, so many born basically value diversity. Uh, they see each person as valuable and a resource. Uh, and we believe that everyone has something positive to contribute in our encounters with one another. Um, so in theory, many born are, don't, are not political, in theory. Um, and they, they shouldn't really, well, many born shouldn't, it, it, part of the group, the, the, the purpose of the group is not to involve ourselves politically, or to try and change the system. But of course, there have been people who have become very political and that there is a branch of the group that is quite political. Um, but Mavada's original idea is that, uh, is that we don't involve ourselves in why the refugees are here or whether they should be here. Um, and we only take into account the fact that they are here uh, and we leave it to the authorities to decide whether they should be given the right to remain. And until this decision has been made, we are friendly and welcoming and make their lives, you know, try and keep them occupied and, and give them a, a network of people. Uh, just because this is seen as common decency and compassion. Uh, and Benny Borna don't actually have a political agenda. Um, so we respond within the rules and frameworks that have been established. Um, but of course, the, the group is very diverse. It's a grass, grassroots uh, movement. So um, there have been various, there have been, uh, people have kind of found different ways of um, being a venue boy. Uh, and at the moment, this has be, become a bit of an issue um, because our minister, Inge Stoiber, has uh, criticized one particular venue boy for um, criticizing uh, a tent um, camp in Herslev for the conditions not being very good in there. So she's criticized that. Um, and there, there are a branch, obviously, Marit and, and the group feel that we shouldn't really be politically involved, but then there is a group that is politically involved. So, that, I mean, I think that happens with any party or with any grassroots movement, is that you you get people who just get, you know, will be, we'll be more in contact with things like the underground, uh, you know, with, with people who are hiding out in Denmark and things like that and helping them. And then you get the people who don't really want to go out, out on a limb in that way. Um, they just want to help people as far as they can um, and staying within, staying, within, um, staying within the framework of the law and within the limits that that imposes.
Um, but basically what I would say is um, my experience with Wendy Borna is that I, I met um, at the end of 2014, I met a lot of refugees um, because we organized a day for them here uh, where I live, which is in Tavasto next to the beach. Uh, so very nice. We had, um, we had music, we had the Queen's hairdresser come and cut people's hair. And, we had um, horse rides and hot chocolate over, over a, a campfire and a really huge table of food with, uh, done by one of the cooks here, who's a gourmet cook. And it was just like a day for them to get away from the camp, which was really, really amazing. Um, so I think there was 120 people who came then. And then I, um, I have a handful of people that I then had something in common with, or sort of there was kind of some kind of chemistry there, and we became friends. Um, of those people, uh, most of the Syrians have remained, and most of the other people have been kicked out um, or have left of their own um, accord because they've been refused. They've left and gone to Germany and gone to France. Um, and that in itself has been quite painful, actually, because some of the people that I left, that I really got very close to, were kicked out. Um, and then some of the people that I got to know who remained have settled in really, really well. Um, in particular, the Syrians um, seem to settle in pretty quickly. Um, learn, if not one, two languages in a year. Uh, it's quite an amazing group of people, actually. Um, and, and we initially, what we did was we would drive out, pick up a few people, take them back home uh, and have a meal with them, and go for a walk. I then started to take some photos for people and I did a little project with um, people's stories online, which is called The, the Moon and Three Stars, um, where I just asked people to write about home. Um, and um, so they just wrote something in their own language about home, whatever they wanted to write, whether it was any detail, their personal details, or just something about their house. Um, and what else we've, I can't quite think what we've sort of facilitated. We've helped with uh, visa applications, we've helped with school applications, helped with language lessons. Um, I've had actually had people step in and help me with stuff because they they have the, the luxury of time and we have the luxury of networks and the fact that we are here so there is definitely an exchange that goes on um, and it's been incredibly enriching to get to know so many people from so many different cultures and and get to know people who are in incredibly difficult situations but still manage to smile and joke and 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 and, and basically you know enjoy their lives despite the fact that they um, but, you know, having said that, um, I'm personally quite very critical of the system, actually. And I wouldn't I wouldn't say. I mean, everyone is political in a sense, you know, I, I, I have political views. Um, I don't like in but I don't like dance folk. Um, you know, everyone has their personal political views. I haven't gone. I haven't gone the route of, you know, breaking the law or, to, or taking people in cars to Sweden or anything like that. But, um, you know, there are people who, who, who do that and feel that they, that is the decent and common thing to do. So I think that the nature of the movement is quite interesting because it is a grassroots movement and there are lots and lots of different types of people. So it is quite difficult to control. Um, and I think that's, that's, that probably has been a bit of a challenge. I haven't really been a part of that uh, challenge, but I know that it's been a bit of a challenge just trying to contain the movement. Yeah. But generally, uh, generally a very positive thing to be a part of, a very interesting and positive thing to be part of. Great, <clears throat> great. thank you so much. Um, if, before we dive into questions, I'm, I just want to remind the viewers that you can actually still there's still some time to submit questions if you still have a couple of questions. And um, Inger, thank you so much. I think we'll we'll start with the questions pertaining a little bit more to your personal involvement. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps could you tell us a little bit about how did you stumble into Vindibon and why uh, is it that you're spending, um, you know, why is it this particular um, issue of all issues of all grassroots movements that just really gets you excited? Um, well, I think that I think 
one of the things was it was it came up as um, as um, at a party um, that there was uh, one of my friends Jens Kusman uh, Thompson wanted to do something into Asta and um, I was part of the group then I thought that was a great idea um, uh, but being a part of it has been has been important I think because it is the issue of our times um, and we could anyone could basically become a refugee. Uh, at any time and that's very clear from the people that I've met they've had normal lives uh, which have just been shattered by some circumstances you know they've had good jobs they've... so in the sense of you know treating other people the way that you'd like to be treated um, I think that's that's the basic thing and and trying to make a difference where I can um, and um, that's it, really. Many of our um, learners have started um, social projects and movements themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and um, some of them have grown quite big. So, for example, some of our, our learners um, started um, an organization called United Youth Journalists that have thousands of followers now um, that publish their own uh, articles pertaining to the issues in the world that you know, they are passionate about. And what we see is some of our, our learners go from, you know, having an idea or wanting to join a movement and then all of a sudden it begins to grow bigger. And you're mm -hmm. commenting on some of the, um, in terms of organizational, uh, both challenges and benefits that happen when an organization um, grows bigger. What has it been like to be a part of that journey? Because um, over quite a few years, Vindeborn has become a household name in Denmark. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any perspectives on that? Well, I think it's. Uh, I think it's sometimes. Sometimes it's unpleasant, actually, um, to to see the kind of problems that arise, or the conflicts, or the comments that come sometimes. Um, and I find that I find that actually a little bit difficult. But I think it's inevitable. And I think that I, as time has gone on, I've just settled into just sort of sitting on the fence a little bit and watching it play out. Um, because basically. Um, I've used I've used quite a few branches of the groups. I've used um, people who are sort of more political to help other people. You know, like people who've ended up in prison, for example. You know, there've been people in Copenhagen I could draw on because there's this network. The network is important, and using the network properly is important. So not actually falling out with people or or having or having parts of the network that you can't pull, you can't draw on, is for me that's quite important. So I always, I always try and operate on the greater good, um, the greater good, uh, what's it, uh, kind of basis. So I'd say, okay, what's a greater good here, you know, is you just let this go uh, or, you know, will not get involved here. I mean, I try, really, really try not to get involved in anything that isn't just helping a refugee basically you know because that's kind of for me is the is the the, the ground the, the principle is that if you can help and there have been some individuals that i really have prioritized about everything else because there are a lot of things that one can do you can you know go and paint crockery or you can do art classes or you can you know i have a lot of skills i can draw on. i have a lot of things i can draw on but sometimes the most important thing has been to help one person write an application for something or helps one person make a phone call and that is a, that has just taken priority so i try to sort of keep that kind of uh, eagle eagle eye view of things and, and just say you know what's what's the best thing here and who might be the best person to contact um, so I, I see it always as a network and i see it as a as a help like a little push in the right direction um, and uh, so so that's that's kind of how I used and I really try and stay out of anything that I feel like the, the, the Inge Stoiber, I think I, I feel is just political maneuvering on Inge Stoiber's part. Um, but that's my personal view. Um, and then that's got to be dealt with by the people who, you know, I mean, Mareda has the Vinnyborne trademark as it were. She's the one who started the movement. She's the one who's spearheading the movement. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who is uh, managing that particular way of doing it. And then, you know, to my mind, uh, that has to be respected the way that that's, that's uh, handled. 
Um, and then you have your personal views. I mean, you know, it's not a political party, it's a grassroots movement and the grassroots movement is helping other people. So doing that properly. So um, for the people who are not tuning in from Denmark, I, I wanted to ask if you could clarify a little bit. Um, I think it's quite interesting how you're outlining um, the relationship between being a grassroots movement and maneuvering a very political topic and a very political you know um situation um and um and then you talked a little bit about when it becomes civil disobedience and people mm -hmm. you know decide to do things that aren't within the framework of the law uh, but depending obviously on your perspective um some feel very strongly that this is the right thing to do and we've seen sort of acts of civil disobedience you know throughout the world um mm -hmm. in different in different times and certainly also many acts of civil disobedience have been um, later viewed as helping create a historical change that was needed, you know, for that period of, of time. Um, but just in order for, re for our learners to really understand, could you say a little bit maybe about like, what is civil disobedience maybe to you? Um, and then also explain a little bit because you used the example of, of, you know, putting a refugee in your car and driving them to Sweden. So perhaps the viewers that aren't so familiar with the Danish situation, perhaps you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, well, um, refugees arrived and had to walk. Um, I forget exactly why. I think the, the trains were stopped and they started walking along the road towards Sweden. They were basically trying to get through Denmark. And some people picked them up and took them to Sweden in their cars. Um, which is regarded as uh, people smuggling, uh, human trafficking, I think it's called. I don't know, um, I don't know what the, 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 the English term would be. Um, and got fines, and people got fines for that. Uh, and they just felt that that was the right thing to do. I can't say what I would have done if I'd been in my car uh, on that road, or I didn't want to get in my car and pick people up. Um, I didn't feel the need to do that. Um, but I would imagine if I'd driven past or was on my way, then I may possibly have been tempted to pick people up and, and take them. Um, but you know, it's all a, it's kind of a, a, a matter of degree of how you feel, where you are, what you're doing, um, and how many resources you have. Um, I have times when my resources are very low and then I opt out quite a bit. Um, so like I've, I'll have a month where I'm just too busy or it's just too difficult or the kids have been sick or, you know, I have to, pri everyone has to prioritize. And, and some people have thrown their life and soul into the movement and has thrown their life and soul into helping refugees. And I think what, what Vinny Borne is, it, what's quite important about the movement and why it's so successful is that people do what they feel they can do you know, what they, what they, what they can stretch to. Um, and I think that's been part of the success of the movement is that you don't feel like you have to just drop everything and, and go to Greece and, and, and fish people out of the water because people, you know, not a lot of people can actually do that. Most people have commitments. They've got mortgages to pay, they've got kids to look after. Um, what, is, what is, what is very important as, as well is that, that respect that people get met with means an enormous amount to people. You've got no idea, you know. Um, I know that some of the refugees that I met in December, I think it was January actually, at the meeting, said they, they were shocked at how they're, they're, they were met with stares. Um, these are people who've held, held high-ranking jobs or, you know, have been respectable citizens uh, in their own country and have been driven out by war um, they arrive in a town and people look at them like they're dirt you know the important thing was for them to be met with that friendliness and respect that you know that's you, you you can almost not put words on how important that was um, so it's all a matter of degree of how you know civil disobedience can be enough that you are that you're friendly towards people actually that you actually um treat them with respect and say i understand your situation and i understand it's not your fault and i understand you're not here to take our jobs or try and leech off the system um that can be civil disobedience in itself 
I think. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate also a little bit more or, or, or comment on, um, so Vendi Borne is today a nationwide initiative. And as you said, it has all, you know, the movement has spread to other countries. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is um, a coincidence it was born out of the periphery rather than Copenhagen? Um, because I think perhaps some would assume that these type of initiatives would come out of cities that have a higher extent of diversity, but in fact it sprung out of a place um, that had a, a large influx, but in a very heterogeneous community otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, I'm, I moved from London to this area myself, so I've seen the strengths of being out here and the weaknesses of being out here. Um, and there's, gen there's generally, I think, young is generally, people are generally honest, you know, there's not a lot of theft and things like that. Uh, people are generally friendly towards each other. Uh, in our village, people know each other. You know, when I first came here, people would, they wouldn't, oh, they'd knock on the door once and then they'd walk in kind of thing, you know. So it's kind of, <laughs> you know, there's something to get used to there. Um, it's a different way, it's a different mentality in a way. Um, so they, there's that there's something about people here that there's a, there's a kind of a generosity here um that i uh that i don't think is really present that much in cities because people are kind of it's harder to survive and people don't you know it's kind of they're more people basically so the bigger the city the more aggressively people defend their space, I suppose. Whereas here, it's a kind of softer and kinder environment. So that's it's possible. However, I would also say that uh, movements are uh, very often lucky in the people that they that they um, have spearheading movements. So someone like Moveda is very kind of steadfast. So she'll just she just you know carries on. She's very friendly and very kind of you know measured in the way that she uh, deals with things but she's also managed to um, gather a lot of very resourceful people around her so uh, there's like a handful of maybe yeah i don't know i don't i, I couldn't can actually count but you know maybe 20 people some are very resourceful people who in their own rights have um also been at the front of other movements um, like our jazz festival here in, in our tiny town you know a couple of people there have been part of that movement and that's very successful um, they have their own businesses they're very successful at those they're also people who've moved here um, so they're people who call called um, so then they're maybe not residents here but they're good at activating other people um, and then also with the Venibor, with initially with the um, refugees that came initially, there were an extraordinary number of very resourceful, highly educated people who came in the first batch of refugees. Um, I don't really have that much of a feel for who's, who's, who's out there at the moment because I've got a new job in January. So I've kind of pulled, pulled away a little bit to focus on that. Um, but there, there were an extraordinary uh, group of people who came. Um, journalists and scientists and teachers and you know the people who, who just really had this energy so it was just like this combination of people which was absolutely perfect for the time um, who made this um, movement uh, very visible because um, also the movement became very visible very quickly because of um, the network that we established, I would say, also the network that we established with that first party was quite important because we had the Queen's hairdresser and we had people taking photographs and all this became very visible very quickly because um, we had Jens and Mess as well at the party and they nationally known as um, on, on TV as um, antique dealers. Um, so we had a few well-known people, we had um, press attention immediately because of that. Um, and then, um, and then we had some good photographs and good, you know, good events happening. So I think that's why it was an explosive growth because it could have been very, it could have been a very quiet little event that we held and it could just have remained where it was. Um, but, um, 
but no, it's um, I think the moment the media eyes on on a, on a movement like that, you kind of have other people think, oh, that looks pretty cool. I'd like to be part of that. One of the things that I would like to say is that when I was at the party um, and Jens said, oh, you know, should we do this event? I thought, oh, that's great because doing that means that I don't have to do, I don't have to actually turn up at the refugee camp and introduce myself and say, can I help? Which for me, like, was really difficult because I'm a little bit shy or whatever. It just seemed like a, it seemed like a very uncomfortable thing to do for me. So other people being the first movers on that was important for me to join them. Uh, and that's the same, you could say the same about all the other um, Venny Borna groups on Facebook. There was an existing group, a lot of members. Then it was easy. And it's also easy to see, pick up the principles are pretty simple. Um, and the principles are pretty simple because people don't have to be part of an organization. So they organize their own stuff. So if someone turns up and says, let's go for a walk. And, you know, 10 refugees say, oh, that's a great idea. Let's go for a walk. Then you've got one event going on. Those people then in turn may um, strike up a particular relationship with that venue and be invited home to tea. Um, so, so that's sort of that's that's kind of how it happened for me. Is that I I think I had maybe yeah just a handful of people that I thought oh you know. and then of course at some point for me it things started shutting down because I couldn't uh, I couldn't have any more people in my in my circle of friends that I could kind of um, promise to support um, in any way because it was just that was kind of full you know obviously people have gone off and they've become very uh, independent and you know done their own thing and so on but um but you still feel like you need to be there and you still need to you know take an, an occasional email have a coffee get together you still need to have time for that in the day and sometimes i feel like i don't have enough time so i've kind of shut down a little bit now which in itself is a little bit difficult actually it feels a bit unfriendly doing that um but um i think it's important also for it to be manageable as of any bore to remain of any boys to be able to shut down a little bit and say, okay, that's can't do much more. I can't actually take any more, take on any more friendships. Um, but it's been, it's, it's very important for people who are, uh, are a bit lonely, maybe, you know, I think a lot of people are attracted by the fact that they can meet other people and they meet other Vinny boys as well. So there, there are a lot of uh, friendships that arise out of that. Great. I, I wanted to share, so our learners um, are aware, but Inge, um, you had not, hadn't had the chance to, to hear this, but I'm actually um, conducting my PhD research in um, the use of social media amongst migrants and how it influences um, their lives, and, and also quite a lot of the data that I've come across, um, specifically here pertaining to the periphery versus the cities, indicate, mm -hmm. um, particularly the studies from Australia, that almost the further out in the outback you're placed, the more likely you are to feel welcomed and integrated, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah quite the contrary of of sort of popular um, belief. Yeah. Um, we have two questions that are somewhat related to each other. Um, so, how do you keep the spirit of Vendipuane moving uh, when you move the idea uh, to other countries uh, and you create other groups and and related to that? Isn't the spirit of the movement a bit lost when it spreads to other countries? I think the nice thing about the movement is that it can be so local. So um, it can both be local and it can be national or international. So um, I'll just relate, relate a little incident. I'll relate a couple of incidents because um, we did uh, a cafe and the cafes are quite important actually. Um, one of the first cafes was a tiny little room in this little barracks called Cafe Sunshine. And that was where um, people could drop in and maybe meet up, have a cup of coffee. Coffee I think cost two krona, which is like 20p or whatever. And sit down, have a chat or do a little workshop or borrow a book. Um, and they had little, um, they had some used clothing that people could buy for, like, again, 20p or two krona. Um, and that, the idea of that is that now being transferred to uh, a much swankier premises. Um, I think it's, it's hard not to be more swanky than that. 
but um, quite a nice um, area which we've actually decorated and um, you know there's like a new kitchen and so on and but still you know used clothing and cheap coffee a place where people can play music um, and uh, and then it's staffed by Venibor, um and by refugees. So the the longer the refugees are here, uh, they obviously um, get they get their um, um, residency at some point. Um, so they and they learn the language. It's amazing. It's it's really it's a bit much better place to learn the language than going to a language school because people sit down and they've got more patience and they play a game and and they do have these real life situations where people can actually sit down and practice their Danish. Um, but um, when we were doing the cafe, the new cafe. I decided to do stripes going down the walls because I was going to, I was, I was helping just giving some guidelines on how it should be um, decorated. And um, we needed some paint. We needed paint in different colors. And I went to the shop and I said, you know, we're doing this cafe and it's for Benny Borne. And, you know, could you do us a discount? Well, straight away we got a discount on the paints. It was really cheap. And we got 30 different colors of paint. And then I went and I needed syringes. So I went to the other pharmacy and the syringes were like quite, quite, quite expensive. And then one of the Venibor was a doctor. And I said, oh, you know, do you, don't, you don't happen to have any syringes. And she said, yeah, how many do you need? I said, well, you've got 30 colors. She says, oh, just give me a second. She came over and she had 30 syringes and a big box of latex gloves. And she said, there you go, you know, help yourself. And then, the, and then I didn't have time that weekend to finish things and people just turned up and syringed the walls. And so they had all these drips going down the wall, took it absolutely ages, but it looked fantastic in the end. Um, and then, um, and then uh, people came with used, uh, with old antique um, chairs and tables and things like that. And within almost no time, the whole place was, was finished and sponsored and um, so, so that's, that's the power of that network and the power of that sort of way of thinking, you know, that's uh, sort of almost crowdsourcing, I suppose, um, way of, of producing something was important. But then that also works in other ways, because I had a friend who was um, from Armenia who was, um, went to Copenhagen to um, speak to the police because she'd been refused. But she had a she had an, an application pending for to become an au pair. So she kind of thought, oh, you know, she's not going to cooperate this time. Um, so she'll say that she won't cooperate in being sent out. Uh, and then she'll wait and see what happens with the visa. And that had sort of worked for people up till then. Uh, but the rules had suddenly changed. So suddenly she found herself in prison with no clothing, with no money, with, with just nothing. And she just called and said, you know, I don't know what to do. Can you just, you know, try and, and then I, 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 I was too busy to do anything at the moment, at that time, those particular days that she called. So I just thought, okay, who do I call? And then I tapped into the network in Copenhagen, which was just amazing. And people just came out of everywhere and helped this girl until, you know, until she left, um, was, well, she was actually sent out of the country, but, but the fact that people were turning up and um, got on, on the line to Dance Flipping Yelp and uh, got on the line to um, and you know, all these organizations were suddenly mobilized for this one particular person. Uh, if you can think in terms of network, uh, but think broad, so think, think, think in the refugees, think in kids thinking older people particularly people who are retired they're the best they're absolutely amazing they've got time they've they very often got huge numbers of skills huge networks themselves um and and then um you know if, if you're not if you if you don't exclude people and if you think of us as one joined organism then that is what many born should be of course, it's not always perfect, and of course, there are conflicts, and of course, people have differences of opinion. Um, and there have been, I know there have been a lot of um, 
challenges um, with there have been a lot of challenges and people get upset about things and 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 part of part of you know trying to contain the movement is trying to contain the influx of things and people offering stuff and uh, and just trying to hold that little bit at bay and then looking at what is manageable and what is uh, useful and uh, what is best what is the greater good uh, but again you need that strong core of people who who will hold the thing together um, that's important could you could you have perhaps sorry, sorry tell, tell us about that the, the relationship between art, art and, and, and refugees sorry you'll have to repeat that because i couldn't hear that can you hear, can me, you now? hear me now yeah. um, um hold, hold on, on i'm gonna see if i can, can find you your your mic. Mic. great because now we could hear me both in, in uh, my screen and your screen. So I go, went ahead and mood, muted you for a second. I was wondering, so this class is sponsored by the Danish Immigration Museum, which has a history of both using art as forms of therapy and expressing yourselves for migrants of different kinds, but, but, um, but also to illustrate Danish migration history. Um, and I know from your personal background that you also have a background in the in the arts and uh, You also mentioned that you are doing these Stories where people are telling their own story in their own language. So first of all, can you tell me a little bit about do you feel that art? Um, and 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 the role of cultural institutions in this field is, is that important and also could you tell us a little bit more about the things you've been doing on your own and, and can we see any of that anywhere and I'm going to go ahead and unmute your mic. Here we go. Oh, hold on one second. Hmm. Inge, if you could unmute your... It's not allowing me to do so. So you just take your mouse and at the top of your screen... Um, yeah, is that oh, better? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I, I did, a, um, I, I work cause sometimes I work in the dark a little bit because I, I think, oh, that's quite interesting and maybe I should work on that. And then I have these, these projects, which tend to be very long term. So they grow over time. Um, and one of those projects was the moon and three stars. Um, and, uh, it arose out of being asked to do a project for a, a magazine called Blixer Art, um, which had a theme of home or actually of Bully, which is not quite home. It's more like house. Um, and I was, I thought oh, I would be quite interesting in terms of the refugees and asking them to maybe work on that thing. Um, and then, um, the people that I asked, I was quietly, um, I said, you know, I'll, I'll do some photographs for you. So it'll be a bit of an exchange. You give me a little bit of writing. I'll do a drawing of you and I'll do a photograph of you. And then we'll put that up on Facebook. And eventually we'll have an, uh, an exhibition. So I've done one exhibition with it, um, which has just been at the library. Um, and, um, and then I was quite uh, astonished at how difficult it was for some people. Some people actually opted out because they, one of, one of the women said to me, this is just too painful. I can't do this. I'm really sorry. Um, and I said, well, that's, no, I totally understand that. But everybody, uh, everybody kind of approached it differently. Um, so, um, the, the project actually gets its name from a poem by an Assyrian guy called Kasim Asmail who's a poet um, and he wrote this uh, beautiful poem about his uh, wife and children and missing them and uh, seeing them in the sky as a moon and three stars because um, he's waiting for, he's waiting his reunification with his family. So I took that as the title of the, um, of the project and um, and then I just added stories as they came in. Uh, and then I, I exhibited it at Ewing. And I thought, oh, what I'll do is I'll put it onto like um, a wire fencing and then just hang them there, the stories with the portraits. And the portraits are actually drawn lines. So I actually look at the person and I, I just do a drawing of their face. Um, 
And then some of them are really beautiful, actually. I did three portraits of each person, and then I did uh, a series of photographs of people. And then I put them up there and I invited people to write their own stories. And uh, there was just like this, I came, you know, after a month and there were just like all these stories in languages I couldn't understand. I still haven't picked them up because I've been so busy. But there's more stories that will be going onto the, um, onto the Facebook group at some point uh, in Greenlandic and, and, and a lot of different other, other languages. So the idea is obviously quite, quite an interesting one, even though it's very simple. Um, uh, it obviously has relevance for people who have lost their home uh, to think about what, what, is, what is a home. Um, and then I've worked with, um, I actually had a refugee group around because I work at Kunsten uh, Museum of uh, Modern Art in Ollebourg. Um, I do mostly teaching for kids in our art lab. Um, but very often we do, uh, we use the same principle for adults, uh, uh, which is visual thinking strategies and allowing them to come come to their own conclusions about the artwork by asking them very simple questions about what they see and why they said why they seeing that uh, so I, I had a group going around and that was great actually we went to see Ernesto Neto's um, large installation which is all crocheted and knitted and has spices and it's one of these total installations so it's, it's a very very contemporary piece by uh, quite an amazing international artist uh, and we went down into the lab and and did some work down there but the, the, the most interesting thing was sort of at the end of the session, at the end of the three and a half hours, we went off and did, had one look, uh, a look at a, a painting by Harold Scott Miller uh, called uh, Primavera, which has a priest and a woman. Um, I don't know if you know, but there's a, there's a woman offering a, a guy a glass of wine and it becomes apparent that he's a priest and she's kind of tempting him. So this was a, an interesting uh, discussion and that went on for about half an hour with uh, people really kind of um, reading something which was culturally for them all this, the symbols were kind of very foreign it was very interesting because they didn't notice things like the priests um, uh, collar and but but eventually they came they they found the, they found they found it out themselves they figured it out themselves with a little bit of help from me um, but working within, uh, with cult, I mean, working with something like that is incredibly valuable because you can kind of open people's eyes to signals and things that they might not understand otherwise. And that's just one particular example. If I were to do another, to do an, another um, tour of the gallery. I'm actually going to specifically choose artworks that will be interesting for them culturally. Um, you know, possibly the series about flags by um, two Danish artists, which are flesh colored flags. I forget their names now. Um, and talk about the Danish flag and symbol, you know, because things like that you can't really pick up in, this, in the more nuanced way that you can uh, in, a, in a gallery where you can really get under the skin. It was so interesting, one of the guys said, uh, he, he said about the primavera, he said, oh, you know, I think he's completely in love with her. He's swimming in her eyes. And I said, what do you mean by swimming in her eyes? And he said, we say that, we say that he's swimming in her eyes <laughs> when you're in love with someone. And for me, that was, uh, that was uh, an interesting cultural observation that I've learned. So there's an exchange happening there. And I think the, the, the nice thing with Bennyborn is these exchanges, these constant exchanges that happen over a cup of tea or, you know, said, oh, we don't do that. Or, oh, why did you do that? Or, what does that mean? Or, you know, I often have a friend who comes up to me and says, you know, you're going to have to explain something to me. <laughs> and then he'll come with something that's very everyday kind of stuff that uh, for him is just, you know, very foreign. Um, so, so yeah, so actually going to the museum, I felt was very interesting um, and, and looking at artworks, but also working with artworks um, and working down in the lab with materials was very good. I just have a delivery over here, my daughter. <laughs> well, Inge, we're actually coming to the end of our session together. Um, okay.
But um, I wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of both Canopy Lab and all of our viewers. Thank you so much for both um, telling us about the role of, of uh, civil society and grassroots movements maneuvering political landscapes and how each individual can actually um, help migrants, help refugees, and, and be a part of, of changing their lives for the better. And that you, you've taught us that we can do this in, um, in flexible ways that are suited to our own schedule and, and the obligations that we may have in, in our own lives. And um, you've shared with us um, reflections about the role of uh, art, of community spaces, of drinking a cup of coffee. And um, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, for all of the learners out there, I'm going to make sure I get some um, feedback from Inge on the Facebook group with the art project and on the specific paintings you talked about. So I can share that on the group as well. And uh, Inge, we'd love to hear you know more from you. And um, and we're definitely going to feature more about Vindibuan on our, our blog as we move forward as well. Thank you okay. to our uh, our viewers. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you very much.